All right, so welcome back to Computer Science E75, Building Dynamic Scalable Websites. Tonight is Lecture 12, where we finally focus on the word scalability. Uh, one big announcement, which is that in two weeks' time, besides your final projects being due, uh, your final projects will also be on exhibition. So last year, we began uh, what we've dubbed the Computer Science Fair, which is actually a really nice way we found to end the semester, whereby students in this room, students uh, tuning in from afar, will hopefully join us on campus, uh, 6.30 p.m to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, two weeks from tonight. Uh, the location will be announced, but it will be somewhere on campus here in Harvard Square. And the goal will really just be to mingle with each other, with the teaching fellows. We'll all be there. Uh, the general idea is that you'll each be asked to bring your own laptop or laptop that's of a friend's, so long as it has wireless access and either an AC adapter or a decent battery. Uh, the goal will be for us to just all put on name tags, uh, mingle with some cakes, to be clear, um, and see each other's projects, which you'll be exhibiting on your own laptop. So it was a really nice way we found last year to end the semester. So hopefully it'll be a way for you to not only see what other students in the class have done, uh, but also a chance to uh, just to get to know people, since uh, probably this side of the room has never met this side of the room, despite, uh, <laughs> despite the proximity here. So tonight's really fun, I think, because a whole bunch of different problems arise when you actually have to care about scale. You can get away with a lot of bad code when it's just you using your site, or just a few people, or even just a few hundred people, but you really start to find all of the breaking points when you have hundreds of people hitting your site, thousands of people hitting your site, worse yet, simultaneously. So we, for instance, learned this the hard way with our own uh, VPS-based server, which I use for my fall class as well, whereby, long story short, we have in this course some 300 students, uh, 50 plus of whom might show up at office hours uh, during a busy night during the week. And for years, we've just used a whiteboard whereby a student who has a question during office hours sits down to the computer terminal after writing their name on the board and from top to bottom, left to right. And then we, the humans, go around helping students with their various bugs by crossing a name off the list and then moving on to the next student. So it works very well. It's a very simple technology. We use a whiteboard. And uh, we've done it this way for years. But we decided we're computer scientists. There's clearly better technologies than this, though that's in some sense arguable. Uh, so we decided to computerize this whole process. So we wrote our own little Ajax application, which was meant to be a website that students go to when they sit down at their computer terminals. They then, when they have a question, click a cute little icon that says, I have a question. And they type in briefly what their question is. And then we had one central workstation that the teaching fellows and I would use to glance at, see who has a question, where they're physically located in the lab. We would then click a little checkbox saying, I got it. And then we would walk over to the student and help. Unfortunately, we didn't really think through the implications of having even just 30 or 50 computers having browser windows open simultaneously, all of which were, again, using Ajax to periodically pull the server to find out the student's location in place. So we learned literally the hard way uh, that our server cannot withstand 50 hits per half a second or second. I mean, it wasn't even that high. Uh, and it was just a matter of bad coding on our part. It was not an insurmountable problem. Like The goal being solved was to re-implement a whiteboard using a few lines of PHP code. It's doable, but we didn't do it very well the first time. But what this revealed to us was what the capacity is of our particular VPS. This was not a lot of hits. But students had multiple windows open. We had made mistakes in coding up the AJAX such that we were hammering our own server way too much unnecessarily. And so these are the kinds of challenges, fun problems perhaps, that arise when you actually start to put more load on your server. So we, for instance, have used a variety of techniques to try to get ahead of the curve, both with, for course purposes and then also for consulting purposes in my own life. A wonderfully useful technique I've found um, personally to load test one servers is to really take advantage of this virtualization technology. So we're using Servant again, which is a representative of a virtual private server. Even better than that particular vendor is something perhaps from Amazon. Some of you might be familiar with EC2, the Elastic Compute cloud. So it's the same idea whereby you can have access, root access, to virtual machines running various flavors of Linux and even Windows these days. And you just pay by the minute, or really by the hour, for exclusive access to virtual machines. So a really useful tool, perhaps, that you yourselves might want to take, uh, take advantage of over time is if you've got a server or a bunch of servers that you want to load test, 
That, that is to say, you want to hammer on them with a whole bunch of HTTP requests per second or SSH connections per second, anything with high load. The expensive way to do that is to go buy more servers than you already have, wire them up together, and then have those brand new servers hammer on the old servers. The catch there is that once you're done testing the load of your, the capacity of your servers, you've kind of just spent a whole lot of money and might not have use for these servers. And this is where computing on demand, cloud computing, to call it the sexy, trendy term, is really useful. So we spent maybe $5 to spawn a whole bunch of VMs, half a dozen, uh, a dozen virtual machines, all of which had you know, two or four cores, each of which was one or two gigahertz, plenty of RAM. And essentially, we just ran benchmarking software for one problem that I have in mind, whereby we knew that our website was www.foo.com. We were curious to see at what point foo.com would actually break. So we configured these six or 12 virtual machines that were elsewhere on the internet, hosted somewhere in Amazon's data center, to just hammer the hell out of our own foo.com web server just by making HTTP requests after HTTP request. A popular tool, just for reference, is something that comes for free with Apache. There's a little command line tool called AB, Apache Bench. It's not all that hard to use. You can just simply type on most Linux systems man AB to get the man page for it. And it's a command line client similar in spirit to wget or any utility that just makes HTTP requests. But you can tell it spawn 50 threads simultaneously and hit this URL, wait this many milliseconds between requests. And if you do this on a whole bunch of servers at once, you can somewhat realistically mimic real life load. Uh, you can somewhat mimic the notion of a slash dot effect where suddenly thousands of people visit your site at once. Now it's not a perfect test because Amazon servers themselves are all probably proximal to one another so you might run into bandwidth issues coming out of Amazon or into your own server. So it's not a perfect replication but it's such an easy and compelling and inexpensive way of banging on your own servers for literally pennies or dollars because you only need these resources for a brief amount of time. So we do this for instance for this current um, position I hold in New York, whereby we get, this is for an advertising network that's similar in spirit to Google Analytics, has a bit of JavaScript code embedded in a whole bunch of popular websites, such that anytime someone visits one of those websites, our infrastructure itself receives an identical HTTP hit. So this means the more hits other people get, the more hits we get, which then have to be logged and analyzed and such along the lines of, uh, again, Google Analytics, that kind of technology. So we get on a typical day 200 million hits per day, 500 million hits per day, which if you do the math works out to be 2,000, 3,000, sometimes 6,000 hits per second. Now, CS75.net would break very quickly if that were the case. And this is why attacks like denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks, if you've heard the term, are so easily waged and are so problematic because it's really not that hard to take down infrastructure. Well, it's slightly harder for adversaries if you've actually given some thought to today's topic, scalability, and thinking about how you can not only scale in the face of potentially um, adversarial attacks, but also just in the face of increasing need and loads and trying to stay ahead of the curve so that you're not reinvesting in new hardware and so you're not rewriting your own code when it's kind of too late, when your whole system's kind of falling apart. So that'll be one of the focuses for today. Was there a question? No? OK. So let's, let me offer some recommended reading, because there's kind of um, more than other topics, there's a lot of people who like to talk about this particular one. Um, these are some books that I would say are fairly helpful, but they're also, many of them, kind of hand wavy. Um, you, I once thought that uh, building scalable websites would be the perfect book, tells you what to do, but it kind of talks in general terms. So what we'll try to do tonight is talk in slightly more specific terms, at least with regard to the technologies we've been using and talking about all semester. So PHP and MySQL and these kinds of things. We'll keep the focus on them simply because it'll be much more relatable. And we'll try not to wave our hands so much at some of the details. Uh, this is what happens when Google Images fails you, when you Google something like scaling. Uh, but one of the, the first topics that's worth um, introducing is something that is general. So this notion of vertical scaling versus horizontal scaling. So to set the stage, suppose that you are running a website or you are running a network of some sort for your corporation, your university, I mean even out of your home because you're a hobbyist, and you simply need to make some decisions as to how many servers you're going to have, uh, how many databases you're going to have, and in general how many hits per second or per day you want to be able to handle, um, and probably as cheaply as possible. 
So there's two general options to this as your load increases. So the more hits you're going to get, and we can now define hits as HTTP hits, MySQL hits, whatever. So some web-based application is getting an increased amount of load. How do you go about handling more and more requests, more and more responses. Because what's going to happen, perhaps needless to say, the more load your server gets, the slower it's going to become for everyone. Uh, it's just going to start timing out for some users potentially. Most of us have probably been to a website, uh, whether it's in some moment of national crisis where you're trying to get to CNN.com and it just doesn't work because so many other people are trying to get it at once. Uh, uh, sites like uh, MySpace, for instance, experience peak load around American Idol being shown because people tune into their profiles of their favorite contestants. So you have very interesting traffic patterns that arise very unexpectedly. And this so-called slash dot effect, if you've never heard it, refers to the result kind of generalized these days of suddenly having your website get a whole lot of attention, such that a whole lot of people try visiting it at once. It's non-obvious and perhaps impossible to be able to handle those loads, um, at least not without some forethought or, frankly, again, money. Um, so let's consider the options. So the simplest approach in general to scaling out your database capacity or your website's capacity is just throw money at it, to be honest. If you have a server that's one gigahertz with eight gigs of RAM, but you find that it's slowing down during peak loads or it's just not handling as many users as you would like, well, a very easy solution is take your same code, take your same database software, and move it to a server that's two gigahertz with 16 gigs of RAM or three gigahertz with 32 gigs of RAM, but dot, 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 What's the first problem we encounter? OK, so there's definitely this, right? Vertical scaling tends to be expensive because you've probably all learned that there is a consumer or as a business person that there's usually a sweet spot uh, where you get a lot of bang for your buck so far as cycles and RAM goes versus money. And it's usually not by riding the edge of that curve, getting the fastest CPUs possible, the most RAM possible. I mean, that's really where you tend to get screwed financially. What other problems do you ri run into? Okay, so that's true too. If you don't know when these peak loads are going to come or if they're ever going to come, you either have to buy a whole lot of expensive hardware in advance that might not ever be needed or used. You're going to be over capacity or you're going to buy it too late because you're not going to be able to necessarily to buy, install, configure a server during the day in which you're being slashed audit or equivalent. Yeah. So there's, all, there's these really interesting but non-trivial ripple effects of having to scale out your infrastructure. When you're kind of small and you're just kind of a, maybe a hobbyist or even a small company, you know, adding a second server, third server, maybe not such a big deal. But down in New York, for instance, we have over 100 servers. And when you start pushing the envelope and talking about tens of servers or hundreds of servers, then you kind of have to learn something about power and electrical wiring and the amount of cooling that's possible and the amount of physical space that you need for all of this equipment, and then just the sheer manpower you need, because inevitably the more servers you have, for instance, Google is kind of the extreme, they have hard drives fail every day. I mean, maybe it's even every hour these days because they have so much damn hardware, and you need to be able to handle and tolerate that and pay for it, too. So really interesting ripple effects happen, too. But there's another problem with this idea of vertically scaling just by getting the best equipment possible. Like, what's eventually going to happen? Yeah. All right, so there's that reality too. So you can throw money at a problem and kind of hide what could have been maybe some smarter design decisions early on, right? If you write a horribly inefficient loop that iterates a million times when really, had you paid attention in like CS1, it could iterate logarithmically many times, you all well, just throw some hardware at it and that problem gets kind of hidden. Um, but it's not going to fix the problem fundamentally. But there's this other problem by just getting the best, best, Right. I mean, what's the fastest computer you can get to these days? You can get CPUs that are like 3.2, 3.4 gigahertz. You can get four cores, eight cores. But you can't get 100 cores so easily in one machine. You can't get a 10 gigahertz machine so easily or so cheaply. So you run into some real world limits, right? Moore's law uh, kind of dictates where we're going to be next year. It doesn't mean we're there now. And so you'll run into realities like you are buying the top of the line server from IBM, uh, HP, Dell, 
But that's kind of it. So if your code still sucks at that point and your load is still that high, you, there will come a point where you just can't solve it by ignoring it and just throwing hardware, throwing money at it. And so the more robust solution in general and kind of the best practice or the mentality that's worth getting, getting into is this notion of horizontal scaling. So vertical scaling implies just go up and up and up the curve in terms of performance and bandwidth and, and CPU cycles and RAM amount. But instead, try to get the cheaper hardware, the slower hardware, but just get more of it. And write your code, configure your network in such a way that you can scale horizontally. The principle there being that you can kind of sort of scale infinitely in this direction. The only constraints being these of space and heat and such. But you don't run into these artificial barriers of the stuff just doesn't exist. Because it does exist if you focus on the horizontal. So what does it mean in terms of vertical, just to be clear? It's not just CPU cycles. It's not just RAM. I mean, it's lower level details, too. You can get more L2 cache. You can go with 15. 1,000 RPM SAS drives instead of the slower but bigger and cheaper 7,200 RPM uh, SATA drives, for instance. So you have all these different trade-offs, again, most of which boil down to money, but they're only going to get you so far. So horizontal scaling, and this, unfortunately, I couldn't get very good photos of a data center that were compelling. This one's not very good. Horizontal scaling is perhaps best depicted by, say, aisles and aisles of servers, all of which look identical and just are all doing the same thing. But low, uh, requests, hits, and whatnot are being farmed out among any one of these servers. So what's a problem with horizontal scaling, if any? OK, so you introduce new challenges. Like if you have now one, uh, if one server, like CS75.net, and one database is all very clean. right? We've discussed things like sessions. Recall sticky sessions. Um, actually, did those come up yet? Uh, yeah, those came up in the context of, um, of our security discussion. But if you have multiple servers, what are the implications if the user on their first request is routed to this web server? But the second request, they're routed to this web server. And the third, this web server, well, where does their shopping cart live? Right? Because how is a shopping cart, or in the context of PHP, really implemented typically? With a file in the temporary directory, where does that temporary directory live? So on the server, but if they put something in their cart when they were here, that means that your widget is on this server, but that gadget is on this server that they next clicked. And so now you run into what's called load balancing challenges, whereby you have to decide how to maintain persistence of sessions in the face of users' requests getting routed potentially to a different server every time. So we'll come back to this tonight, because there are solutions. You don't necessarily, there's different approaches to that, both at the network layer and also at the, the application layer. But those are the kinds of things that begin to arise. Same thing with a database. If you have just one database, it's all very simple. Write, your, write to this database, read from this database. But what if, a la Facebook or any reasonably sized website these days, you have to have multiple databases because, again, of these glass ceilings. You just can't get a super powered computer for financial or technical technological reasons, so how do you start breaking up your data such that the user doesn't have to know or care about the underlying implementation details? We've seen a bad example of this idea, load balancing, in the context of, I think, that, that Domino's Pizza uh, screenshot, I think. What, what did we pick on them for in that one example? Yeah, so they had hard coded, and this is not uncommon. We had gone, I think, I had gone to www.dominoes.com late one night to order some pizza, and just somehow I got routed to www.03.dominoes.com. And my takeaway was that, OK, they probably have at least three web servers, and just pseudo randomly I got assigned to this web server. And that's nice and simple, perhaps. It, apparent, it seems to solve immediately that whole problem with carts and temp files and whatnot. But what if that server goes down? Right? They're going to lose a sale if I am suddenly reaching a dead end. And the user then realizes that there is more going on behind the scenes than I should really have to care about. Right? A really savvy user might realize, oh, why don't I just manually change this to www02 and I'll get my pizza. Most normal users are just not going to get their sale as a result of something like that. So more on that in just a moment. But let's focus for a moment on some of the, the software-based approaches. So PHP kind of sucks in terms of performance. 
Right? If you're coming from the world of C++ or C or even Java, like the code that you write in those languages tends to be compiled. And as you probably know, compiled languages tend to be faster than interpreted languages because there's a lot less overhead. So if you compare various applications written in C versus, say, PHP side by side, odds are the C application is going to win again and again and again because there's less overhead. Now, you might be able to write the code in PHP far more quickly. right? You don't have to reinvent for yourself the notion of a hash table. You just use dollar sign foo, and there it is. So again, there's trade-offs here. But what can you do in the context of PHP? If you like PHP, and frankly, I do, it's nice and easy to use. The learning curve is low. It's got the kitchen sink in terms of functionality. What can I do to at least mitigate these implicit costs of using in a language like PHP? Well, there are code optimizers. So there are tools that you can download, free packages often, that you can install on your web server that simply make your code run faster pretty much without your having to do anything other than figure out how to install that software. Um, so a lot of research has gone in over the years to taking a language and interpreting it faster than, say, the off-the-shelf implementation of, that the interpreter would use. But more than that, what PHP Accelerator, so to speak, can do is this thing called opcode caching. So there's this inherent inefficiency in a language like PHP that's itself stateless, whereby every time you visit foo.php with a browser and foo.php is on a server, odds are, given a default uh, implementation and installation of Apache and php.exe or equivalent, that file foo.php is getting compiled essentially again and again. And again, and again. So PHP files aren't quite read top to bottom, left to right, like a shell scripting language. They are kind of compiled, but on the fly, sort of unbeknownst to you. But that process tends to happen again and again and again for every darn request that the web server serves up. So a very low-hanging fruit for optimization here is just to somehow teach the web server to remember, if you've compiled this code already once, tuck the resulting bytecodes or opcodes into a folder, and next time this same file is requested, serve up that cached version. And hopefully there's enough intelligence in this accelerating software that realizes, oh, wait a minute, the developer just changed this file because the last modification time and date changed, something simple like that. Let me recompile it then. But again, all of this can happen fairly transparently to you. And these, the options are several. And these are four of the most popular and certainly freest versions when it comes to PHP. Um, we on CS75.net, I believe, are currently using, uh, we're not, uh, let's see, we don't use it on CS75.net, but I'm on a different server using eAccelerator. And it really didn't require all that much effort to install. And frankly, I didn't even spend much time benchmarking the before setup and the after setup because I just know that in general it tends to speed things up. And I was just trying to do some easy things to mitigate um, what are the implicit costs of using a language like PHP. And if you Google around, you'll come up with plenty of benchmarks comparing this option versus this one. But know for tonight that these things exist. And there are ways of mitigating what otherwise might be some downsides of using a language like PHP. So any questions about sort of what it means to be an interpreted language or what it means to accelerate execution thereof? Yeah. Are these all PHP accelerators? These are all PHP accelerators, yep. Yeah and all free. There are. I mean, a lot of research has actually gone into optimization of JVM code and doing uh, writing smarter JREs, Java runtime environments, so that um, the Java bytecodes are actually compiled more efficiently. Um, the names of those escape me because it's been a few years. But yes, things exist in other languages, especially ones that are web-based these days. Yeah. Uh, good question. So uh, for the camera, can you implement objects in or classes in C++ and Java that PHP can use or invoke? So short answer, yes. I'm aware of the existence of some frameworks that make it easier for you to hook into other languages like C++ and um, definitely C++ using PHP somehow, because I know we looked into this ourselves. Long story short, we wanted to write some PHP code on one of FAS's servers, but they themselves only support essentially a C++ runtime, and we wouldn't have to want to have to re-implement a whole bunch of library code. So we Googled, frankly, found some options. I don't recall the names offhand, but yes, things exist that facilitate that. 
but in general, it's probably best to avoid such, such hacks or such glue if possible. But yes, such things do exist, I know. All right, so now let's, let's assume we've tackled the low-hanging fruit, right? We know PHP is not as fast as some languages, so we install an accelerator. It's not going to make it as fast as some of the lowest level languages, but it's better and it costs us relatively little. So we're done with that. So now we have to focus a little lower on some of the more interesting architectural decisions. So now we're talking not at layer 5, which is the so-called application layer, HTTP and that kind of stuff, but now we're going one layer deeper, what's called uh, layer 4. So layer 4, the protocol that's usually involved for those who've taken a networking class or are generally familiar. Uh, it's, it's one more down. So layer four is TCP. So if you've ever had a conversation or familiarity with TCP, UDP, these are protocols that live conceptually. This is just a conceptual framework at what's called layer four. So the whole notion of port numbers, like 80 is web, 25 is SMTP, this is relevant in a discussion of what's generally called layer four. So this is relevant for us because web traffic, HTTP traffic, is a service that operates ultimately at layer four. It's not just IP because that traffic, even though it's getting from point A to B, browser to server via the internet protocol IP, it's also traveling into a specific port, for instance, 80. And so in general, and again, this is just conceptual stuff, in general, when you start talking about load balancing, you often talk about it in terms of layer three and layer four because the two are so interrelated. So what does this mean? So suppose we have a user represented here by that uh, user and terminal there. He is somehow connected to the internet, represented here by this cloud, and he's trying to access some website. Maybe it's dominoes.com, maybe it's the next version of cs75.net, such that that website is implemented ultimately by way of multiple servers, www1, 2, and 3. Now, functionally, these are all the same. They all have the same code, whether it's PHP code, Java code, whatever. It's installed identically on these three servers. But the reason these three servers exist are essentially so that we can handle three times as many users as we could with one server, or maybe just as or more compellingly, what is another upside of having multiple servers like this? Just intuitively. Sorry? Yeah, redundancy, right? If one server dies, its hard drive dies, its fan dies, its power supply dies, well, there are two others that can pick up the slack. So in fact, I probably don't want to require three servers to handle my load. If I want redundancy, probably want four servers or n plus one of the ones I actually need so that I can tolerate failures administratively. It's really useful to be able to get away with turning off one of your servers or unplugging it so you can add hardware to it or upgrade software, change things around. That's a nice luxury. You don't have to worry about, you know, let's hope no one happens to need our website in the middle of the night as is a very common approach, right? We've all probably gotten emails from Harvard or Jobs where the IT folks say, all right, folks, everything's going to be down from 8 p.m. tonight to Monday morning. Like, it doesn't always have to be that way. It's easy, but it doesn't have to be, especially if you've designed your infrastructure cleverly and maybe have thrown a little extra money at it. So what's the simplest mechanism with which we could balance load, so to speak, over multiple servers? So I'm a user. I type in dominoes.com. I hit enter. I now am the owner of dominoes.com. Like, what are some ways, based on, say, some of the lessons of this class, that I could use to take that user's request, and I'm now this black box here, load balancer, and say, you go here. Next user, you go here. Next user, you go here. Like, what could we do technically to implement that idea? Sorry? All right, so we could have some kind of redirection. right? So we could have each of these web servers using some heuristics such that, um, if they decide I'm too overloaded right now, let me bounce you to www.dominoes.com or equivalent. So it's doable even in application code. Not very clean, and also the servers have to have some kind of built-in mechanism for monitoring themselves, but we know how to redirect traffic one, from one to another. Can we, re, uh, can we factor out this decision, though, to a device other than the web servers themselves? Like, what could we put in front of these three servers? OK, a load balancer is the answer, but how could it operate? There are many different ways to implement this idea of balancing load this way, this way, this way. Round robin counter? We could use what's called a round robin counter. So 
what does that really mean? So if you kind of uh, fast forward one more slide, we actually have a very easy mechanism for doing load balancing. You have it in the form of um, uh, directed man, you have a nice little GUI to make this possible, and it all boils down to that stuff from very early in the semester. We, uh, lecture zero, I think, in fact, lecture zero or one, when we talked about DNS. So DNS has kind of always been this middleman, not just for web stuff, all internet traffic, pretty much, that allows you to map host names to IP addresses and vice versa. Now, the user, recall, is probably typing in dominoes.com. Their operating system is eventually asking some DNS server what's the IP address for that server so as to contact it, what if that middleman simply gives a different answer based on the time of day or based on the last request? So we can implement this idea of round robin, i.e., you get this one, you get this one, you get this one, now you again, you again, you again. This is what we mean by round robin just by returning a different IP address in sequence. So for instance, if we have not three but four servers, we could configure bind, our DNS server, or whatever we're using, to have multiple A records for foo.com or dominoes.com. So you might remember vaguely the syntax, at least for bind in a Linux or Unix environment, looks like this. And this means that www.domain.com, whatever it is in context, will map not only to the A record of 64.131.79.131, it will also map to any of those other three. And the way bind works by default out of the box is that if you have multiple A records for the same host name, for the same URL, a different IP address will be returned in sequence for every request. And when it gets to the bottom of the list, the next guy will get the first answer again. And so you get, for free really, with DNS, this ability to do round robin DNS rotation. Yeah. So it's a good question. If there are complications, so if you have a middleman between you and this middleman, like your own ISP's DNS server, this won't work as obviously because if Comcast decides to cache the first of those for a good 10 minutes or an hour, you might skew the load. So it might not be 25% per server. But if you assume that there are other ISPs besides Comcast and you assume a little bit of randomness in the world, it's not going to be as bad. It, it won't be that everyone is ending up on that IP. So theoretically, that's possible. So yes, there are some gotchas, one of which is caching by other people and even your own browser or your own operating system. Like There's so many places where DNS entries get cached. This is why it's a pain to move IP addresses per previous discussions. So what's another downside of this DNS-based approach? It works, and it's actually pretty easy, right? If you know how to add a DNS record, just add three more, and you're kind of done. You have a load balancer. If Slate is redirecting to a Slate IP address and the server is currently down for whatever reason, say it is dead end. So that's the catch. And this is where caching is really, really a headache. And this is why you know, even we in this course kind of wave our hands. If you make any DNS change, assume it's going to take 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, just kind of eventually things will work. But you need to be smarter if you want things to work right away. So the problem here to be clear is that if a browser, if an operating system, if, a co if an ISP, or if your university's DNS server, any of those things can cache, cache a record such that the next time you try to visit dominoes.com, you get an IP address that now just so happens to lead to a server that is no longer live you might have the impression that that website is offline for well longer than it actually is, when there's really just another IP address you could be hitting. So the upside of DNS-based load balancing is it's so easy. And in general, you don't even need to have root access on your own server, because you can be hosting your DNS entries with GoDaddy or with Network Solutions or with whomever, and you can just have multiple server accounts and implement load balancing very simply at um, at the IP layer using DNS, but there's these gotchas. And the biggest one is if you, one of your servers goes down and you don't have the ability to move that IP address to another machine physically, your users will very likely experience a dead end, possibly for hours or days, some of your users at least, anyone who's cached that old IP. So it's very attractive, but there are these costs. So questions about this DNS-based approach? Yeah. So that, that too, so it's not really a problem here session-wise because if the server's down and they keep trying to get that server, so it doesn't matter if their session's there or not. Yes, so there is, so we'll come to that in just a moment, but yes, so that is sessions 
are a problem if you are bouncing the user from server to server exactly for that reason of temp files. If you put something in your shopping cart when you are on this server, it's not going to be there when you're on this next server. So more on that in just one moment. So what else could we do? Like how could we mitigate this concern here? Well, again, this is kind of a leading question because there's a little hint in this new black box. So this kind of comes full circle to one of the ideas earlier about using redirection or doing something application layer. In theory, you can solve this one problem, say of sessions, by just making sure that the same users always go to the same website. So round robin is dangerous in that the, use, the one user might, during the course of his or her interaction with the website, end up on any number of servers. And that immediately poses a session problem. So sort of the easiest, perhaps most obvious fix is just make sure that a given user, when they come into your cluster, always go to the same server. Now there is a risk. If that server goes down, we kind of have yet another recurrence of that same problem. But at least I don't have to think about this problem very hard. right? It's probably more likely that a user is going to want to interact with multiple pages and thus hit multiple servers than it is during a given period of time that one of my servers is going to go down. Right? I really need sessions. I can kind of deal with one server going down. So it's a trade-off, but hopefully an educated decision. Well, how can you decide to send the same user to the same server again and again? Like at what point in the so-called layers here? from Ethernet all the way up to HTTP, can we make this decision? How can we decide to send one user to the same server again and again? Yeah? All right, so their IP address, right? Just arbitrarily say any IP addresses starting with 1 through 50 are going to go to this server. Any IP addresses starting with 51 through 100 go to this server. So you can come up with any number of arbitrary heuristics that may or may not be sort of well balanced, but they're certainly easy to implement. So long as you have, again, some box sitting between your web servers and the rest of the internet. What else could we do? Yep. If you take the risk of trying to write your own load balancing, you could feasibly have an application between the servers that do the heavy list lifting and the user's computer that sends information to one um, the actual server to do the processing. Okay. Okay, so without going too much into the technical details, you could do something similar in spirit to these home routers that clearly have the ability to take arbitrary information in and route them to the same PC or Mac again and again. You could somehow leverage that same idea, happens to rely on TCP port numbers usually, and kind of embed some kind of metadata going back and forth across the wire that informs your little black box where this user should go. So that would be an option too. What else? If we now want to focus not so much at the the networking layer, suppose I just don't have the technical savvy or I just don't have the, uh, the credentials, the access technologically to do things there, but I do have access to the server here. How can I mitigate this problem of session persistence? All right, so cookies, what do you mean with that? Well, they, they come back every time the user responds. Okay. Yeah, so one kind of clever solution is if the problem is if the problem exists because I am storing information, contents of a shopping cart server side, and this is problematic because, again, I have multiple servers, well, why not eliminate the problem in one fell swoop by just starting to store things on the client side? Right? We know from cookie, the existence of cookies, you can kind of put an arbitrary amount of information into the user's hands and just expect that, assuming they have cookies enabled, they'll just send it to you on every, every, every request. Now, there is a limit on the number of bytes you can actually store, so you can't store arbitrary, truly arbitrary amounts of information. But if you're just storing like item numbers or SKUs or quantities, that might be a reasonable solution. But let's be a little more creative now. So acceptable solution, perhaps, and fairly easy. If you know how to write PHP code or even JavaScript code, you can store information on the browser and just kind of trust or hope that it will be sent back to every time. What else could we do? And leading questions here, but what else could we do? Yeah. Yes, 
So irrespective of sort of the technical specifics here, if the problem is that my temp files live here and also some are here and also some are here, well, we're all generally familiar with the notion of a file server, right? Even if it's within a home or an office, why not just give each of our web servers, one, two, three, dot, 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 access to some shared disk space? So whether it's a hard drive that's physically connected to multiple servers, maybe it's a so-called file server, there's a whole bunch of ways of doing this, but in general, it's called shared storage. And if you kind of want to sound impressive of it work and toss around some acronyms that a lot of people never actually understand. Uh, Fiber Channel, iSCSI, NFS, I mean these are kind of the right acronyms or buzzwords that relate to sort of enterprise use of shared storage. So in the home you probably have like um, you know a Linksys device or D-Link or a Drobo, kind of a neat fun toy that is a file server. In the enterprise, you have things like this. Now, NFS is actually really simple. Using NFS, for instance, if you have a, a Linux background, it simply requires that you have a Linux server with its own hard drive, which obviously are there if it's got an operating system on it. You essentially configure a couple of files, and you can expose to your whole LAN any directory you want on your Linux server using this protocol called a uh, network file system, so NFS. And it just sort of shares it a la Windows file sharing or Apple Talk or, or whatever in Mac OS. And so long as you know how to configure your other servers to listen for that data or to mount, so to speak, that directory, you can create the illusion that some disk is actually attached to multiple servers at once. Yeah? Yes, so that's the thing. We just kind of keep pushing the problem elsewhere, which is why, to be honest, I think this is always a very interesting sort of problem to reason through because, yes, if we now are kind of solving our problem by centralizing everything, that's kind of a conceptual step backward from where we began because originally the problem was we had a single server. It doesn't handle an arbitrary amount of load, certainly doesn't handle uh, faults if it goes offline if we have just one server but now we're trying to solve the problems we just created by centralizing things again so to be clear what if your file server goes offline what happens to all of your sessions Right, so here too is an opportunity to use some judgment. So we, we sort of began this conversation by doing this a lot. Well, maybe the right place to throw money is something like shared storage where you optimize for one thing that you really, really don't want to go offline, but you really cut corners on things like the web servers and even buy used equipment or use old servers because you don't need super powered computers if you've got a whole bunch of them. But you really want to minimize the probability your central file server is going to go down or your central database. So again, there's discretion there. Yeah? Uh, I was going to suggest there are, you can mitigate there with, uh, say, read or um, dependencies in the file server, right? So you don't expect the dependency because you have a mirror copy. So exactly. So and without sort of going off in wonderfully fun but very uh, easy tangents tonight, you can certainly have redundancy even within the confines of one server. So what was just proposed, this technology called RAID. And it's actually increasingly common in consumer devices too. Uh, as an aside, if you ever buy a PC these days or a Mac, make sure it has two hard drives and a RAID 1 configuration because it will literally have the probability you're going to lose your data because essentially RAID 1 means you have two hard drives identical in size and they are perfect copies of one another. And these days it's increasingly done automatically without you having to have fairly technical chops to figure out how to configure this. You just, just kind of comes like that with Dell and even Apple's these days. So yes, there exist technologies even at this lower level um, that allow you to again mitigate, not do away with, but mitigate these concerns. So if you've never, if you entered this course kind of having a decent programming background or full-time programming background and never kind of considered these things, I mean, there's a lot of interesting effects that, frankly, your bad code can, can create for other people, but it's all the more fun, I think, to get involved in, in these kinds of decisions. So. Uh, for what it's worth, um, so many possible solutions. So what does it mean then to be a load balancer? So a load balancer is just a device or a piece of software that spreads load, whether it's HTTP hits or SSH connections, whatever, across multiple servers. Now you can do this very expensively, but very robustly in a manner that tends to please people who care about uh, brand names and such by buying stuff from Cisco and Citrix and F5. Those are kind of the three biggest players. But even a low-end load balancer from one of these companies tends to run you $10,000, $20,000. And at the end of the day, these are really just Unix or Linux-based devices that have some amount of research put into, but a whole lot of marketing put into, to be honest. Because you can do fairly well 
You're not going to maybe get the same kind of support contracts, but fairly well with off-the-shelf free solutions, um, any number of all of which are software-based. So you can have your own Linux box or Mac OS or whatever you want to run, and provided you choose an appropriate package, uh, some of them are goofily named, as you'll see up there, but they do the same thing. And again, the difference really is just in the cost and the kind of support and maybe quality you'll get, but there exist options out there. So for instance, for my class in the fall, we actually used Amazon's EC2 service instead of servants for our cluster because we had 300 students in this class. We would kind of learned our lesson in the past that you know, most of the students in this class don't really use CS75.net. It doesn't get a lot of hits per unit of time. But with CS50, this other class, we had all 300 students sometimes, Thursday nights before problem sets were due, working on the cluster at once. So one server just wasn't going to cut it. And it's really bad if 300 students uh, can't do their work in the middle of the night because your one server goes down. So there was kind of a nice opportunity for redundancy. And so we were certainly not going to spend $20,000 on a device just to balance load and mitigate the low probability that our server is going to go down. So we went with free software, LVS, in fact, Linux Virtual Server and it gets the job done just fine. So there's some fun things to play with here that um, solve these same problems. Questions? All right, so why don't we take a two minute break here and then we'll revisit and probably wrap up a bit early tonight. Two minute break. All right, so unfortunately there's no one solution to really any of the problems we're talking about tonight because it really boils down to almost every problem at hand to trade-offs, whether it's money or time or complexity or your own sort of technical savvy. So unfortunately we don't really have a perfect solution to the one we just put forth out of sticky sessions, but there are different options. And that's really frankly what any discussion of scalability boils down to is what risk you're allow uh, willing to tolerate and how much you're willing to spend for it. But other problems arise besides this of sticky sessions or just getting users to multiple servers at once. And that is how much load you have to put on your servers versus how much you don't. That was not very well put. All right. Um, there are lots of websites, for instance, Facebook, where the data does change, but it doesn't change nearly as often as it is viewed. So most of us, even if you have a Facebook profile, odds are if you're killing time, you're looking at more profiles than you're actively changing your own. And there's an opportunity there. Because if you are, if in order to view a Facebook profile or any kind of equivalent site that in, clearly involves database calls, if you are executing the same database calls again and again and again, and the common case is reads and not writes, you probably don't need to be executing those same identical database calls again and again and again. Maybe do it once and then remember the results. Right? This is sort of a fundamental computer science principle of caching. Right? Especially when operations like database queries tend to be more expensive than fopen foo.html spit out the bytes. Right? So there's different levels of complexity involved in any kind of website and typically serving static content, whether it's a GIF, JPEG, or HTML file, tends to be much, much less expensive computationally than opening a, a TCP IP connection to a database, querying the database, having the database engine search millions of rows potentially, return some results, you iterate over these results, you generate some HTML and then spit out those bytes. I mean, the mere number of words it takes to tell that story versus serve up foo.html hints at the number of cycles and time involved. So there's this opportunity to cache. Anything that's expensive to do, try to keep around the answer for as long as possible. And in the case of Facebook or equivalent, the only time you really have to flush your cache or update your cache of web page profiles is when a user changes that profile, which might happen reasonably frequently, but again, probably not as frequently as the reads. But there, too, is a design decision. You, uh, you know your data best and have to decide what you're going to optimize for. So the funny thing is, a really easy way to cache output, Facebook doesn't really do it doesn't do it this way as obviously, but is to do what Craigslist does. So if you've ever visited Craigslist and have checked the job listing pages or whatnot, you'll find that a lot of the pages, um, in contrast to almost every website out there these days, almost all of the pages end in what file extension on Craigslist? Yes? 
.html, right? It's almost sort of old school to see a web page ending in .html these days. But what Craigslist apparently does, even to this day, is when you post an ad for an apartment or whatnot and click Save, what's really done is that the data is probably stored in a database somewhere. So it's semantically tagged, and it can be editable by you later, a few days later. But what they seem to do, too, is take that user input and generate once, and only once, a something.html page update a master index page, right, like the search results, which they even disclaim this page may take a couple minutes to update, because even they just kind of lazily update that page as infrequently as possible. And then every time another user is searching for like a MySQL short-term project in Cambridge, they're going to see this static content again and again and again. Now, in the rare case where the owner of this job posting realizes, oh, damn, I need to make a change to this, then Craigslist is presumably willing to incur the computational cost of querying their database, giving the user an HTML form to then update the database, after which they'll regenerate this HTML page. But that's the uncommon case. The common case is probably for people like you and me to read job listings like this. And therefore, if web servers these days, 2009, they've been around for a while, are really, really good at reading in, a la F open, a bunch of bytes from disk and spitting them out over a network connection with no database even involved, that's clearly what they're optimizing for. Now, what's a downside of this approach? Caching on the user side, so their browser might be more likely by convention or by design to cache files ending by default in .html, the idea being they might not be updated as uh, frequently. Now, technically, we can spill, still spit out with HTML files no cache headers, for instance, but that's probably contrary to what Craigslist wants to do. Right? I would almost conjecture that Craigslist probably prefers that the user figure out to hit forcibly reload a page in the off chance its, actu its content has actually changed. But again, a design decision there. We've seen in this course even how you can spit out no cache-like headers, probably. What's another downside? Yeah. Uh, you've got all the extra storage of the particular pages. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So you have all this, right, behind this web page is a whole lot of ugly HTML, lots of open brackets, lots of closed brackets, lots of words like body and, and head and, and B for bold and such that would not be stored where, by contrast? Right, in the database, right? So there is some redundancy textually and storage space. So there's another one of these trade offs. So it, disks are kind of cheap, and HTML pages, even though they're bl more bloated than a row in a database might be, this whole page, a kilobyte, maybe two kilobytes, it's still pretty reasonable. And again, what are we trying to optimize for? Well, in Craigslist's case, probably load and the number of users they can sustain per second. What's another downside, though? Yeah. Right, so the website is not dynamic, right? And arguably, Craigslist is among the uglier websites out there because they really just don't change the design much at all, other than to add like arbitrarily placed boxes and more colors. But the implication is that beyond a little bit of CSS, if they want to sort of overhaul their aesthetics, they have to regenerate every possible page. Now, maybe that's not that hard. Maybe it just means change a template and sit there for a few minutes while all hundreds of thousands of pages are regenerated. But again, it is kind of a downside, arguably. It's going to be very expensive computationally to overhaul the site. But again, that's probably the uncommon case. So it's, again, one of these trade-offs. What's an upside of this approach, though? Anything beyond the... Yeah, it's kind of simple, right? I mean, not to be derogatory, but like someone with just a minimal amount of programming experience can implement this idea of caching, right? Generate a page, save a .html file, update a big index.html file, and you're kind of done, right? There's no savvy, there's no sophistication, but perhaps ironically, it kind of works. At least if you're leveraging what you know to be the case, that static content gets served up really cheaply, really efficiently. So again, some interesting opportunities. Now, most people do other things. So I don't know if Cra what database engine Craigslist is using, but if they or some other site are using MySQL, much like the world of PHP, there are some easy opportunities. There are some easy buttons you can push, one of which is to turn on, in MySQL, its query cache, which literally is as simple as finding your config file, usually called my.cnf for config, and finding this line or adding this line and setting it equal to 1. Now, as the name implies, 
Uh, this enables a cache of queries, which means what MySQL will do is if you execute select uh, star from users where user ID equals 123, well, what this query cache will do is remember what the result is of that query so that the next time you execute an identical query, if the database itself has not changed, it's just going to go to disk it's, or RAM, its local cache of that result set, and return that and not even trouble the database table itself. Now, this is compelling when that database table doesn't just have a few dozen rows, but maybe has a million rows. We're just takes time to find that row, well, why bother looking for it again? Keep it around, especially if it's going to be asked for fairly frequently, as in the case of a Facebook profile or something like that that's very read intensive. So again, some opportunities for um, easy optimizations. An increasingly popular product, free product, that actually Facebook does use and has even supposedly contributed their own patches and such to is this daemon called memcached. So memory cache daemon. So what I have here is actually a snippet of PHP code that pretty much shows you how you can use this. So it's the same idea as Craigslist. Craigslist just happens to be using a file system, a disk, as their cache. Memcached is kind of doing the same, but it's using a combination of RAM and disk. And it's just a little fancier in terms of its optimization. But it's the same idea. And the, the general principle behind Memcached, in the case of Facebook or any website that dynamically generates pages, PHP or any other language is rather than spit out to standard output, so to speak, to the directly to the user's browser, the open HTML tag and the open body tag and all the dynamically generated content, rather than send that directly to the user, first store it in a variable, save that variable to your cache, and then give the user the value of that variable. But the next time the user requests that same content, that same profile, where do you go for the page? You don't go and regenerate via a whole bunch of database queries all of the profile information. You just check, do I have this user ID's profile in my cache? If so, let me grab it ideally from RAM, worst case from disk, or rather second worst case from disk, worst worst case all the way back to the database. And so that's what memcached does. It keeps information closer to the user by keeping it ideally in RAM, but barring an infinite amount of RAM on disk. But at least if it's on disk, then we essentially have this situation, which we already said was kind of better than the database situation. So here's just a bit of code, just to give you a sense of how this works. So memcache. So this first line of code, just like MySQL, just opens a connection to your memcache database. Uh, after that, I am checking. The, for the following. I'm calling the get function in the memcache namespace, so to speak, um, and I'm just passing in some ID. Now, if I get back a value, that means I found the user and I can immediately skip all of the rest of the stuff. But if, in which case, at the end, I would just spit out some content or do whatever with that actual user. But if the user is null, it means this page has never been requested before, or maybe the cache expired, or maybe the user updated their profile. Something changed such that. I got to incur the expense of the database calls. And so we might do something like connect to the database, select a database, execute a query like this SQL statement, select star from users where ID equals ID, fetch the object. But notice what I'm doing. Even though I've stored in dollar sign user this object from my database, I'm first setting this value in the cache so that it's there for later purposes. So this is a general principle that even if you don't want to figure out how to install something like this on your own web server, you can mimic the same idea. So even in one of our course's web servers, we integrate before the current version of CS75.net. We went through the trouble of actually connecting to Google Calendar, grabbing our current list of sections and office hours, and then displaying them kind of in our own terms, in our own formatting on the course's website, instead of sort of taking the lazy man's approach of just embedding the Google Calendar itself into the website. So Google makes this possible via their data APIs. But the problem with an approach like that, actually connecting to Google, grabbing office hours and sections, rendering them with XHTML on our own website, is that every time a student was clicking on a page, we were calling Google parsing the data, displaying it, and then again, and again, and again. Like We don't need to update our office hours every time a page is clicked on, because they don't change all that often. We kind of set them at the beginning of the term, and for the most part, leave them. So we, even in our, we didn't want to set up all this, because this is kind of a lot of work relative to a few lines of code. We implemented our own cache, where we just say, connect to Google once, get the results in a variable, kind of create your HTML, and then we used a little function called fwrite. 
and we wrote the result of the HTML we had generated to a local file. We then spit it back out to the user. But the next time a student visited version 1.0 of our website, we would check, is there an officehours.html file locally? If so, we didn't redirect the user to it per se. We just called fopen, grab the bytes, and then spit out the bytes to the browser. So it's sort of a poor man's approach to caching. But it's again, it's like two lines of code, an if condition to check if it exists, and then fopen or fwrite depending on the context. So it's a very good principle to at least think of when you have to start being more clever about uh, your code and not writing bad code. So any questions about caching? Yeah? Do caches ever expire? Or do you uh, good question. Do caches ever expire or do you have to do it manually? Short answer is it depends. So there are default timeouts for MySQL, for instance. Memcached has default timeouts where the cache just expires about, uh, after some amount of time. But it's really up to you, the developer, as to what you set those values to. And you can certainly forcibly expire it if need be. Other questions? All right. So what about this matter of engines? So we introduced the concept of database engines kind of for a very specific purpose around project two. Why, did it, why was it worth knowing a little something about my ISAM versus InnoDB? Yeah, so transactions, right? There's some interesting monetary implications if you don't have transactions or locks because you can get inconsistent data. People can steal your money by sort of using two ATM machines simultaneously. I mean, some interesting scenarios arise if you don't have uh, the ability to lock your database or lock some resource, the refrigerator, for instance, in our silly milk example a while back. But there's more to database engines than just this one additional feature. In fact, this little chart here sort of summarizes some of the biggest differences between the engines that are most popular that come with MySQL. Um, for our purposes here, the specifics aren't so important, but the fact that there are other uh, engines besides MySAM and InnoDB is. So there's this one at the top of this chart um, called Memory, also known as the Heap engine. Uh, based on its first name, what do you think the memory data engine, uh, uh, database engine, aka Heap engine, does? Yeah, it's kind of neat. It allows you to store tables intentionally in RAM, which is very useful if you've got some really frequently accessed data, maybe not a huge amount, a few megabytes, maybe even a gig or two, but not 100 gigabytes of data. And you know you want it to be very easily accessible. Even better or more useful is if you need to, and it's not often you need to do this, but if you ever need to create temporary tables on the fly, because maybe you're analyzing large sets of data and sort of in, in the spirit of using variables in code, you actually have a whole lot of rows that you want to sort of temporarily tuck aside. You probably don't want to put them back on disk because that's slow. So you can use this memory or heap engine to actually intentionally store a whole bunch of rows or tables in RAM, assuming you have enough RAM. Yeah. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, although um, I think I'd be making up an answer myself if I, if I gave you one. Um, it is kind of funny to see that now. Um, it might also be, there are, let's, uh, let me just see one thing here. Yeah, so there are, so I can kind of fudge an answer here, but I would refer to the documentation for an intelligent answer. Notice that uh, per this chart, some features missing from the memory data type uh, of the uh, database engine are things like B-tree indexes. So indexes, whenever you check that little box in phpMyAdmin for like a primary key or an index or a unique key, what's really happening behind the scenes that you don't really ever notice for projects of the size of this course are that very fancy indexes, so to speak, are being built up in memory. Kind of hash tables, data structures that facilitate fast lookups, fast inserts, fast deletions, and all of that takes up space. And ideally, MySQL tries to keep indexes 
in memory as opposed to on disk, because the whole point of them is for performance. So I would hypothesize that one of the reasons relative memory use is low is because the memory table tends not to use such indexes. It optimizes for putting the data in RAM in the first place, but doesn't build up these auxiliary data structures that themselves just take up space. So you can prove me wrong if the documentation says otherwise, but I'm guessing that's one of the explanations. There's less metadata maintained. So what about my ISAM and InnoDB? Well, here too. This is where it's sort of useful to do your homework when you're really trying to give some thought to the scalability of some application. Because besides supporting transactions, my ISAM and InnoDB empirically tend to perform differently, better and worse, under different use case scenarios. So my ISAM is well known to be very, very, very fast at reads. But when you start doing lots of writes and lots of simultaneous writes, then you begin to be upsides of InnoDB for reasons beyond transactions. And so this is where RTFM and reading the documentation and sort of reading up on other people's benchmarks of these kinds of engines actually can become relevant. Again, not so much for the sort of apps that we've been doing in this course, but the same lessons are applicable certainly to much larger sites. Now, we haven't addressed the problem of databases themselves, which thus far on CS75.NET has always been a central point of failure. It's kind of immaterial because there's only one CS75.NET server. If the server goes down, who cares if the database is up and running? If the database goes down, well, probably went down because the server's inaccessible. So we didn't really put money into um, the redundancy of our server because, again, it's sort of an academic exercise. It's already a hundred or so dollars a month. It's sort of acceptable. We sort of accept the fact that I might be woken up in the middle of the night if the server goes down. That's sort of cheaper, sadly, than throwing twice as much or three times as much money at our infrastructure for the course. So what can you do, though, when that's really not acceptable and you really need to have redundancy even at your database layer? Well, a really common approach is to take advantage in the context of MySQL, but other database engines do this too of what's called replication, whereby by configuring some config files appropriately, and it's usually just a few lines of code, you can configure one database to copy automatically all of its data constantly to any number of slave databases. So you have in this case multiple servers, this case four. So these are four Linux boxes or four Windows boxes. All of them are running MySQL, but the only one your application writes to is the one marked number one. And thanks to replication and thanks to some efficiencies built into MySQL, the moment you write a row or rows to number one, it will within milliseconds or seconds, worst case, get replicated, i.e. copied to numbers two, three, and four. Now why might this be useful? So if one goes down, you literally have not one, not two, three backups, essentially, that are probably identical, or maybe they're missing a few rows at that particular moment in time. But because the backup is essentially constant, they're pretty up to date, which means you can literally just throw number one away, take it offline in completely, and just tell the world, OK, number two is now my primary. You just kind of change the picture around, or you move your Ethernet cables around, or you tweak something at the command line, but you have three hot spares standing by. Now, what else is, why else might this be useful? Because that doesn't feel as automated as one might like, right? Like, David still has to get up in the middle of the night to like, move those wires around. So what else is compelling about this? Because it hasn't solved everything. Yeah, so if we're replicating and we're OK with slight, like millisecond differences in consistency across these servers, I could do all of my writes to the master, but then do all of my reads from the slaves, or my reads from any of them, but maybe just the slaves. So what's a, what's a scenario or a type of website or a use case in which that kind of makes sense? Like have one central place to write, but a whole bunch of places to read. So Facebook, assume now, I mean, there are some obsessive people in the world that update almost as often, perhaps, as, as reading. But probably in the aggregate, reads are more common on Facebook than writes. What's another site where we've already conjectured this is the case? Any kind of product database? Sure, you maybe update it once in a while, but not every second, not every minute. Reads from customers are probably more common. Any sort of news site where even though news is getting posted throughout the day, odds are for every new article you post, 100, 1,000, 100,000 people read it, literally, in that case. Craigslist, too, we sort of claimed or conjectured was optimized for reads because there tend to be far more readers than there are writers to that. So why is this 
to be more clear technically, why is this advantageous to write one place but read from multiple places? Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're horizontally scaling like somewhere, at least part of the picture, because you can imagine more and more lines, five, six, seven. Now granted, you do run into some barriers, like bandwidth, for instance. You can't have a million servers replicating behind one, because you're going to run into a whole bunch of problems, not the least of which is just the number of wires you can physically connect. But you can kind of extrapolate, perhaps, from this, where you can kind of create a tree. Maybe you have one master going to two slaves. Then those two slaves themselves have four slaves. So you can sort of get uh, leverage exponentiation here and just kind of scale out, albeit at a cost in some amount of time. So it doesn't have to be literally always horizontal. Yeah? So you can have different um, firewall rules or security rules that govern who can write and what applications can write versus anyone being able to read. So this does have a ripple effect potentially on your code, PHP code or whatnot, because now you might actually have to maintain multiple connections. One program might have to have one link, so to speak, for writes and a separate one from reads. But you can enforce that. Even though we've never done it in this course, when you create a MySQL user, you've pretty much had access to create table, delete, drop, all of the statements available to you. But technically, you can create users that are only allowed to write and are only allowed to read. So you can kind of protect your data by enforcing certain credentials and certain requirements on users and code and, and specific database servers. Where, so this doesn't seem perfect yet, though, right? There, what's a problem now? So that all sounds kind of good and, and useful. What's a problem with this? Right, again, we always, it's a slippery slope, right? We've kind of fixed the problem, but not with the silver bullet, because we still have a single point of failure. Now, maybe it can be redressed by, again, me waking up in the middle of the night and promoting, so to speak, slave to master, but there's clearly some downtime, because I'm just human and take some time to do that. So it's not perfect, plus, Where's, where's a potential bottleneck here? We can, it feels like we can scale laterally and for reads pretty effectively. What's not going to scale perfectly? Right, so rights. So here, too, is this opportunity to kind of accept in life that there are these trade-offs and there are these sort of uh, inherent ceilings. But maybe it's worth throwing money at the master database, giving it a really good RAID configuration, really fast disks, spending a lot of money there but less money here, and sort of leveraging our assumptions as to our, our workflow. So if you know a little something about your data, reads are way more common than writes, maybe it's OK to spend a bit more money here and worry a bit more about this guy going down and not to care as much if any of your slave databases actually go down. But we can do a little better, and MySQL actually does this out of the box. Just like we can have sort of up-down replication conceptually, you can also have what's called master-master replication whereby your application, whether it's PHP or, or any other language, can write to, say, number one, and that data will automatically get written to number two, a copy of it. But better than that, if you actually want some redundancy in here, you don't want to have all your clients writing to one and then reading from the others, because really then that second master is little more than a slave. So what you instead have is your application, for instance, trying if uh, MySQL Connect database one. If the return value in PHP is null, what should you next do? Try to connect to the second one. So you can do it in code. You don't need access to the system, like low-level access to the system. You can do this with just some PHP chops. Now, you can do this more intelligently. You can actually introduce that other idea from tonight called the load balancer and actually have one IP address or one host name map via DNS or via some more clever means to both of these, uh, both of these database servers. And probabilistically, what will then happen is 50% of your writes will go to one master, 50% will go to the other master. But thanks to replication, the changes will be um, made on both such servers and then replicated in turn to the slaves. The upside of this, if you have a load balancer between your application code and the destination of those rows, is going to be that one of those masters can go down. And assuming your load balancer is not as naive as just pure DNS-based load balancing, then the writes will just subsequently go to the next one. And frankly, if you're talking about your own LAN, you probably, a sysadmin, don't need to worry as much about DNS. Because if you run your own DNS server and you run all of your servers, you can just tell them, don't cache this information for more than 
some amount of time. It's only when you have the internet involved that it's worth really stressing over any DNS based solution. So you can be even crazier than this. So this picture here, a little small, depicts the following scenario. We have a, um, a client network, so a whole bunch of people who want to use this network infrastructure. A very common topology is for a load balancer to sit between the cloud and uh, all of your web servers. That then sends traffic to any number of web servers, in this case five. Meanwhile, if any of those guys ever need to talk to a database, they might write to the so-called MySQL master, pictured it right, but they'll read from any of those three MySQL slaves. Now this is not, again, a perfect picture. Uh, pick, uh, find at least one fault or more faults with it. Single point of write failures, right? So we've kind of accepted in this diagram that if that writes, if that uh, so-called MySQL master goes down, that's kind of it. People can look at profiles, but they're not going to be able to change them for some amount of time. But again, we can mitigate that by throwing hardware at that, right? There's only, odds are probabilistically, hard drives are going to fail. What else might actually fail on a physical server? So a NIC, but even then it's kind of like it's purely electronic, so less likely, I would conjecture to fail, but certainly can happen. So connections, right, human error, trip over a cord, something gets chewed through, certainly. Fans go bad, power supplies blow up. But if you have two power supplies instead of one, and two NIC cards instead of one, and two hard drives instead of one, right, you can have redundancy all within the same chassis. Now that's not perfect if some human makes a mistake or you have to take that server offline or the building in which the server lives blows up or goes offline so it's not perfect but again realize that you can still have other opportunities within boxes on the screen for redundancy. What's another problem with this? A uh, race condition, how so? So, yes. So absolutely. You can get inconsistency of data whereby the data, the server that someone is reading from might not yet have the data that has been written to by another client. And so you're going to need more than just a clever network infrastructure, to be honest, to deal with those kinds of problems. But sure, that's one hole. What's another single point of failure in this picture? Load balancer, right? We we kind of have solved one problem. It's like that analogy where like you have what, like a hose with leaks in it. And every time you plug one, another one springs up. It's it's kind of that same idea. We again have two single points of failure in the form of these load balancers. So the world generally tackles this by having two load balancers. So you spend twice as much money, you can get two identical devices that cleverly talk to one another, such that if one goes down, the other one is supposed to take over. So realize again, without going into too much technical detail. The world has done some pretty neat things whereby you can buy two things, we'll call them load balancers. They have Ethernet cards, uh, multiple Ethernet cards. Two of those are typically wired together, or you have some like serial cable or some other back channel between them. You have one IP address that is owned by, say, this guy. And if this, this guy is essentially monitoring, sending what are called heartbeats in general from right to left. And if this guy ever fails to respond, this guy assumes that his partner is offline. He then takes over that IP address. And so in theory, you can have one machine take over for the other fairly transparently. So there are some very clever solutions that are, again, at a lower level than your PHP code or whatnot, typically at layer two or three or four. Um, but there's clearly lots of sort of opportunities here or lots of problems to be solved or thought through. So what other problems arise still? So when your rights become a bottleneck, because you can only throw so much money and hardware at your rights, you kind of have to decide how you're going to scale out even your writable data. So in the case of Facebook, for instance. So early on, they implemented this idea of partitioning, at least aesthetically, you may recall, by having different host names for schools. So there was harvard.facebook.com and mit.facebook.com. And they eventually got rid of that, especially as they opened up to the world, had different notions of networks. But early on, it looked like, and who knows about the underlying implementation details, but it's reasonable to assume that a possible solution to that problem was to have one database for Harvard, one database for MIT, one database for every school, or something like that, so that you're kind of scaling horizontally, but not by having multiple, multiple copies of the same data everywhere, but partitioning your users into different single servers or multiple say pairs of servers. So you can take this same compelling idea, but say there's one of these for Harvard, 
there's another one of these for MIT, and so forth, and you can partition your data. But partitioning requires that you know something about your data. For instance, that Harvard users in general only are going to click on other Harvard users, which was the case initially. Not so much anymore, so the scheme is probably more sophisticated than that. But in this picture here, the idea is that people with the names A through M have their own cluster, N through Z have their own cluster. But maybe all of that data is eventually aggregated somehow behind the scenes because it's useful for logging purposes, statistical purposes, or the fact that some people from MIT are friends with people from Harvard to be able to aggregate that data still. So um, another idea there. Um, high availability is just kind of the buzzword these days that says you have redundancy and you can tolerate failures of your equipment. So I'll just toss that out there. So there is one more sophisticated um, solution still that's representative of a class of solutions, which is this notion of a cluster, whereby you have multiple servers, all of which are kind of equivalent, any one of which or any two of which can break, and the rest will sort of pick up the load. If you've ever heard of RAID 5 or RAID 6, it's the same idea. In RAID 5, you can have multiple multiple disks, say five for simplicity, one of them can die, go bad, but the other four can take over the role of that fifth one without you losing any data. RAID 6 allows you to lose two such disks and the rest will take over that role. So MySQL has this product called MySQL, which funny enough, at least the last time I researched it myself, they seem to discourage a lot of people from using. And most books on the subject seem to discourage people from using it because of its complexity, supposedly. So this is sort of the state of the art for most people, pictures like this. But this does exist. And this is sort of the right idea, where you have your database becoming more of a black box with multiple servers, all of which are interrelated, any number of which can fail. And the others are meant to pick up the slack. But implementing this well and, and correctly um, tends to require sophistication that has not yet, it seems, been simplified sufficiently to make it as attractive as these simple five line, six line of configuration file changes um, that, that exist, uh, that have existed for some time. So that was a whole lot of information. Um, hopefully you will now exit this course with a bit of sense of where you can go after a course like this and also what kinds of questions you should ask or what kind of problems you yourself might create for other people. Um, but we will see you in two weeks' time at the Computer Science Fair. And in the meantime, if you have any questions about your final project, please reach out to us via the bulletin board or email. So we'll see you in two weeks, an early night. All right, that's, that's our job.